anybody there. Hi. Hi, Susan. Yes, hello. Hello. Hey, wonderful to talk to you. We finally made it work. Yay! <laughs> trying to click on the on the join, but then it wasn't letting me join. So I'm sorry I'm like a couple minutes late. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, first of all, I'm really excited to get to talk to you today. Uh, you are on a roll doing some really wonderful work and I can't wait to learn more about how you make this stuff happen and uh, where you come from. Perfect. So let's start at the beginning and get rolling that way. Can you tell me where you're from? Okay, so I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago. I was born there. Uh, my parents are both from there. My father immigrated to Canada first um, and then my mother came after him and then she got pregnant with me but she didn't know anybody in Canada so she decided to back home and have me in Trinidad so the mm. first few years of my life uh, I lived in Trinidad and I came to Canada to Toronto just before I started school so I grew up in Toronto and it was mostly a, a Caribbean a Caribbean South American South Asian neighborhood it was a real fusion neighborhood where I was brought up so yes yeah, now I'll stop <laughs> so you lived in a in a fairly accepting community. You felt like you you had some cultural support there, right? Well, that's a good question. So when your parents are immigrants, right? And mm. uh, and technically I'm an, an immigrant myself. You tend to congregate where other immigrants of your background live because you know they have the same foods and they all know the same. Uh, music and they do they have the same cultural practices so for the first few years of my life I was very very um, just sheltered in Trinidadian culture because we didn't really have any Canadian um, people in our lives my parents my father worked and he worked with Canadian when I say Canadian I mean you know white people um, <laughs> people um, even though people of all uh, backgrounds are Canadian. I mean that sort of stereotypical in the 80s kind of definition. Um, so we didn't really have anybody who wasn't Caribbean. So mm -hmm. yes, in that sense, I was very accepted. And where I went to school, um, it was all by POC people. So oh, okay. yes, that part of me was, yeah, some areas in Toronto that are heavily um, Caribbean or um, immigrant people. So you'll find, you know, everybody you meet, you, you don't see a, a non-BIPOC person in your everyday life sometimes. So yes, I, I was accepted in that sense. Yes. Mm. Did you have one of those shock revelations where you're like, oh, wait, there's, there's a new world out there? <laughs> Yeah, this is a good question, um, and it's a it's a complicated question, I think, um, because when you I, I I don't want to ask I don't want to ask you too many questions, but I don't know if you have an immigrant experience or if you're a parent or yes, if you're family members. Yeah, and I'm always curious yeah, about okay. that because I'm. I live in the state of Wyoming, and I've been raised here since I was ten. You know, uh, we did have a. A community, a small Mexican community, but it was it's still predominantly a white place for sure. So I, I totally get where you're coming from, and I guess I should have started with that too. Uh, yeah, I I empathize. <laughs> yeah. So for me, right? Okay. So it was a little bit different. My community where I lived was very, very much like me, mm -hmm. cultural wise and ethnicity wise. What started happening to me was. I started liking a lot of things, like I ended up reading a lot, and this is going to sound horrible because it's like, oh, is it reading Trinidad? Of course it is. Um, but, you know, when you're bombarded with media all the time that uh, not produced by your own people or mm -hmm. is not reflective of your own people or presents your own people in a negative light, when you're a child, sometimes you cannot sort of process that and so you start to think oh well maybe I'm not good or mm. maybe people like me don't write stories or maybe people like me are not in movies they're not they're not the the star of the movie 
Uh Or if we are in the movie, we're the joke. Or we're the cashier. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Those are not... The cashiers are great. I was a cashier many years, so I'm not saying anything about cashiers. I'm just saying they're not the central figure. They're they're the lady that the main white figure interacts with as she goes on to have her life. It's it's the supporting character syndrome that uh, I, I completely exactly. recognize. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a, a cashier can have a wonderful main story, but they don't use. They have in the past. They didn't give that to us. Mm-hmm. Um. So I started. Feel, I, I think I had some self hate going on for yeah. for a while. I and I I I sort of my parents were not very educated. My parents don't have even a high school diploma, each of them. Mm. Um, and actually, even before my my father's father like couldn't write his name, I I can see I have my father's birth certificate, and in in the spot where his father's name is. You know how on the TV they they write an X, yeah, and you think, oh no, that's not real. No, if there's an X there. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. So yeah. I, I sort of felt I didn't want to acknowledge this at the time, probably, but I probably felt a little bit of shame and sort of a little bit of self dislike, and so I, I gravitated to all of these sort of. Um, and cut me off if I'm going on. Oh, too no, long. you're fine. You're fine. I, I gravitated to, I really liked gothic horror and I liked so many things about England. I wanted to go off to England and, and you know, go to those schools and those gothic architecture and read <laughs> books and yeah. become some kind of literary thing. I don't even know what it was. And so when I went to university, I told my pa- my mother, because my parents had divorced by that time. Mm. I told my mother I was going to move away. So I moved away from the very like me, by POC, Caribbean, South American neighborhood and went to live in Kitchener, Ontario, which I was the only person of color in the English literature program. Mm. So I think... That was when I was like, I want to go somewhere and do something different and see what it's like out there for me when I went to university. And there were no, no, (laughs) no people like me there. Like there were a few in other programs, but there was nobody. Yeah. And it's kind of a rude awakening, right? I mean, it it just becomes this whole like, wait, I thought that I was something completely different or I thought I even thought I was somebody who didn't belong in, in my own culture. And then you go somewhere else and you realize wait a sec, I, am I here or there or where do I belong? I think it, it opens up a whole can of worms of identity when, you, when you're faced in that situation. Is that right? Exactly. That's exactly what it was. I was like, well, I, none of my, my peers are into the things that I'm into. So I'm going to go to this place and these people are going to have the same hobbies. And did. They did. I mean, people in the English program read all the books I read and did all the things I, I, I was interested in. But then I had a really hard time. The first, the first year I had no friends, like mm. zero. Yeah. And then the second year I started slowly making friends, but it was, it was an uphill climb. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Getting people to be like, <laughs> to oh, acknowledge you. She, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The people didn't know my, yeah, they wouldn't say, I remember I was in class and I asked a girl a question. And she just looked at me and then she turned around and just acted like I didn't ask a question. So I was wow. invisible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's okay. I'm okay. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like those are the kinds of experiences that, that you have to confront yourself with to understand yourself better and to get to a better point of understanding. And I, I totally empathize with that because, you know, I grew up in a fairly white community, uh, Latter-day Saint, mm-hmm. and I did have to go through that experience of like, why am I responding this way? Why do I feel like I'm running away from my culture or my culture doesn't get me? And and it took me a long time to move away from my loved ones, from the people who cared about me to realize, you know what, I've been going about this all wrong. So what was the realization? When did that happen for you? When did- 
Um, when did that happen? It, well, it happened when I went to college and I, you know, I went to the University of Wyoming and I was raised in, in a small town here in the state. And I, I realized that nobody will really understand the cultural perspective that I have because I'm a Mexican mm -hmm. who was raised in Wyoming and I will forever be at odds with, with here and there. And I have to be okay with that. I have to reconcile that, but I can't allow that to push me away from my loved ones, which is what happened at, at one point in time when I was, when I was in high school. And I did have that sort of air of like, nobody, nobody understands me because I'm, I'm transcending my culture in, in a bad way, you know, and kind of how I felt for, no, for a while. I, this is exactly what yeah. happened to me. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. So I, I totally empathize with that. So what was that that turning point where you said, I'm facing back toward my culture? If there was such oh, a point. That's a good question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting fired up because I'm I'm like, yeah, I totally get that. And it's sad and and, and angering. Don't and, be we're, we're here to throw it down. That's right. That's right. We're gonna parse it out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. I think that began in university for me but it didn't when because when i was in university um you know everybody was the same mm -hmm. uh, it was very monocultural over there um and then so i finally started getting friends um but i yeah i i i kind of would drop a cultural sometimes like sometimes i drop like a Trinidadian slang word. <laughs> and they'd all think, oh, wow, that's cool. And then they'd use it, right? But mm -hmm. I still wasn't embracing my culture. It was more sort of a, oh, look at curious thing about me. Like, look at this cool novelty thing. myself. Yeah. Yeah, a novelty thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if, or, you know, you get these group of friends and they'll be like, oh, well, hi, mate the mexican in our group <laughs> yeah. you know like that like that 70s show how they have um they had fez uh be like the i guess the flavor right what they would quote unquote yeah, the call token, the flavor yeah yeah the token brown person in our group and so we're you know we're cool like in big bang theory too they have that indian guy and he's like the indian guy so it's all <laughs> of the indian joke yeah he he, he does um, so I was kind of like that for a bit, right. and I guess I was okay. I was okay with it. I didn't really see anything. They weren't mean or anything like that. They were really, they were really nice, my uh -huh. friends. So I'm not really putting that on them. Right. Um, it was kind of something I played along with. So I really didn't start actually embracing my culture like actively probably until my mid to late twenties. Took a while. Yeah, but I, I think it's part of the process, though. Yeah. School. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think it's it's part of the process. I mean, you you really have to have that much distance between you and your culture and your family, and to have that pushback in in another cultural sense to feel like I am finding my way back to where I need to be. But you have to go that far. I mean, you have to you have to be the novelty person in some respects because some of us don't have that innate understanding of like. Um, culture is there for us always some of us feel like outcasts from the moment we come out you know oh yeah. yeah yeah no i felt like that too i am not like anybody in my immediate family i like and this is not me sort of putting myself on a hierarchy or anything like that but uh -huh. i am very nerdy and i'm very into like nerdy things and they are not the nerdy things they, they accept <laughs> me but they're not into it and so I didn't get that enjoyment of the nerdiness commiseration with those people. And so I felt, oh, well, I can't. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I understand that completely. Yeah. And so with, with that kind of conflict that you have going, how does writing make its way into your life? And then we can try to catch up to that cultural conflict that you're having there. Um, when do you start writing and, and what kind of stuff are you writing about? In the beginning okay so what i've i was a, you know people usually come on and when they talk about being a writer they say oh i've always been a writer mm -hmm. 
when I have a book from when I was five, or I have this unfinished novel from my teenage years, and I actually don't have any of them. <laughs> I, I had a real hard time learning to read uh, as a child. Um, most people, like not most people, but you'll sometimes hear someone say, I was able to read in kindergarten. I, I was not able to read in kindergarten. And I think part of that is, is because we were quite poor. Mm. And we didn't have many books. I only had the books that were from school. And so I didn't get a lot of practice with reading. Mm. Um, and my mom and my dad don't really have, as I said, they, they didn't go to, I don't even think my mother went to like a middle school level school. Mm. But my father did. But they don't, they don't have like high school diploma stuff ish. They don't have that kind of level. So we, they didn't read me. My mom wanted me to read though. She was very, very adamant of, I am not, I wasn't great at school. Um, but I want you to be great mm -hmm. at school. I want you to go and get a good education because the only thing that's going to help you get along here is if you have a good education. So I started really getting hooked on reading in grade three that's when something turned on in my brain and i started reading mm -hmm. and then i never stopped i became a reading machine <laughs> and i i never saw anybody really in the books that i read that reflected me yeah. um and that's an access issue because in sure. the caribbean there are books about caribbean people but there weren't i'm sure you you sort of experienced that as well. No, absolutely. I'm just going to interject one thing, but I remember my family and I would gather around and I actually watched this movie again with my wife. In terms of my representation, we watched Univision soap operas and we watched The Three Amigos. Okay. You know, like The Three Amigos right. with Steve Martin, which is a, a hilarious movie, but we have a, a classically trained Mexican actor who again is playing the villain. <laughs> and, right. and we go like, this guy's hilarious. He's amazing. He's doing his thing. But oh, there's one of us. One of a one of those. There's one of us moments. You know? Yeah. I I have this on my Twitter right now. I have um friend. I met. Well, I taught her in a class, but she's fantastic. Her name is Laura Vidarte, mm. and she was just saying how um when when she was a kid, and uh, this is what Laura says. If you see somebody and they have like they have a sombrero on and you're so excited that anybody is portraying anything of you, even though it's not something that is positive or anything, you're just like, oh, there's somebody like me on the show. Yeah, he's one of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he's representing. He's great. <laughs> this is why I was like, when I was a kid, I loved Sebastian from Little Mermaid because mm. I was like, oh my god, he has an accent. Okay, it's not. It's a more of a Jamaican accent, but he yeah. he 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 plays Calypso, and we listened to that. And I, Sebastian was my <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's fascinating so, because I now, I, and I got to ask you about this because I think that you and I might be from a similar generation, maybe millennial or or maybe not. Yes, yes, yes. I'm oh, one of those older okay. millennials. Okay, me too. What what they would call a geriatric millennial in my case, uh, because I guess yes, you know, yes, yes. they wanted to assault the wound even more. But um, I wanted yeah. to ask you what you think of this this recent thing where maybe younger generations or culturally were looking back at some of those depictions and they're like, we shouldn't have that anymore. Um, and, and I'm curious what your take is on that, because for me, I look back at those things and that's my childhood and something that I embrace, but I don't know how to reconcile it with the, the conversation that's going on now, which is people who, who say that is offensive. So this, this is interesting because they've been doing this with uh, those uh, role doll um Yes. Books yeah. where they're going back and making new editions and taking it out. Um, so the thing is, I feel like art in whatever form is being made at the time when the artist is making it. Mm -hmm. And so it is reflective of their mindset at the time and 
yeah, like I think it's fully well correct and reasonable to say that's offensive. To say that it should not exist, though, to me, like that we should ban it or get rid of it, mm -hmm. is a bit problematic. And I'm not talking from a, I'm not talking from a like a personal like I enjoy it. I'm I'm talking about from a historical record of where we were and how we got to where we are now. Um, I think it's important because when you start to erase things from the past uh, or you start to like not acknowledge it what starts happening is it returns mm -hmm. i mean you don't even have to erase it it returns and it's important to know it's important even as like immigrant groups or or underrepresented groups it's important to know how we got where we are so yeah mm -hmm. you know a kid or somebody can say this is really offensive and it hurts my feelings or I don't like it. And that is completely valid because it's art. Everybody's allowed to react to it the mm -hmm. way they want to react to it. Right. Um, but to say we should get rid of it, I don't agree with. Absolutely. And I think that's the missing component of the discourse is that the nuance is completely gone from it. And again, the historical context is, is something that is rarely mentioned. And I mean, I do, I do agree with you, but it's just such a complicated thing to talk about because now we, we have to condense it into however many characters we have on Twitter and, and it's difficult to have a conversation about it. So I, that's why I love podcasting because, yeah, sure <laughs> you know, yeah, we... you, you did the right thing. <laughs> but uh, coming back to your writing, then did you feel like when you were first doing your, your work that you, that you had difficulty I don't want to say injecting in, but but putting in characters of of color, or was that still your default setting of creation? Because I think that for me, I'm like a brown person can do whatever they want, so they're gonna be they're gonna be you know a doctor, they're gonna be this or that, regardless of what I saw, because I just this is my world and I get to have the shots. Did you have to work your way to something like that, or is that something that comes into the picture for you at all? had to work up to that okay when i i didn't I, as i was i we were having a great conversation so <laughs> i i forgot where i left off but i think i left off i don't i didn't write much when i was a kid and i did take one short story uh, a writing class it wasn't a short story class, and they asked us to write a short story and uh I did a good job, apparently. The teacher really liked it. Mm. But when I went to university, when I did all of those things, I didn't write. I only started writing probably about submission, probably about eight years ago. Mm. And when I first started writing, even my sad attempts before submitting were all trying to replicate stories I had seen before with main characters who were white women dealing with the struggles of life mm -hmm. and um like my first published story does not have any and it's a professional published story um does not have any people of color in it at all mm -hmm. and uh i think that was partly because i couldn't see myself in i i i didn't see my i didn't myself writing about those struggles it's the cashier syndrome like we were talking yeah, about yeah. i i didn't see i didn't see the people of color in the stories that i wanted to write being the main character and so my default i became writing white people mm. yeah. yeah um so yes i had to work up to writing people of color and now i just put them wherever i want uh-huh and I don't think about it yeah. because uh, that was a, uh, that was a, what's the word, a programming I to get rid of. Right. Right. But it seems like you, you actually had to begin the writing to see it. Right. Cause you, I'm sure that you wrote your first published story and you realized this is, this is the best I can do right now. But then eventually you realized here's something that's kind of bouncing my own perspective back at me. What's missing. Right. Did you, um, can you give 100%. me yeah, yeah. Just a, a moment when you had kind of realization or what kind of story did it for you, if there was one? Like my own story? 
Yeah, like a breakthrough story that you that you had that said that made things click for you. Okay, so I had a so I'm a for the most part up until now I've been a short story writer, and um, a few years ago, probably you know, I started in 2015 submitting. And back then, there were people, I'm not, I don't want to erase anybody who was doing work at the time. There were people looking out for more diverse representation, looking out for um, writers who were writing underrepresented voices. So that was happening. It wasn't like it wasn't happening. Mm. But I started trying to write stories about feeling alienated from culture. It, it, it wasn't completely Trinidadian characters at the moment. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, um, it was like a character who felt different from everybody else around them, and they were trying to fit in. I was having a lot of problems selling these stories. Actually, um, between my first sale, which I sold this story in 2015, it took me two and a half years to sell another story and it was constant rejection in between and I believe part of it was I needed to become a better writer but also part of it was a lot of people weren't connecting a lot of editors weren't connecting to the story of being an outsider hmm. yeah. and so I ended up submitting to a special call that was for women at the time and I saw this story called Propagating Peonies and it, it's a very it's still quite Western, but it's about reincarnation and it's about shape shifting and it's about not fitting in anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think when I sold that story, I said to myself, okay, if I can sell this story about being an outsider, then maybe I can push further and start talking about my actual me feeling like an outsider, a brown person feeling like an outsider. So that story it's in podcastle it's called propagating peonies oh that's amazing it's also very I'll have to check that one out. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I was reading your short that you had in Lightspeed magazine, uh, was yeah a Little Mermaid retelling, and and you can see that this is an individual who has gone through that work, through that process of understanding where they come from, and now when I was reading that story, and if and I apologize if I say it wrong, but it was Apple PC. Is that right? The name of the yeah. story? Okay. Yeah, I'll pull the piece. I'll pull the piece. So I have to practice it too. Yeah. Yeah. But what I really enjoyed, the metaphor here that you were playing with was just so brilliant and so elegant that I had a wonderful time reading this, that there were elements of you, cultural bits of where you come from, woven in with, with a, a story that that is fairly universal at this point, but you made it, you made it your own and very culturally true. Um, and I'm curious if we could use that story as an example to talk about that kind of, that kind of change in your writing from when you were first having these cultural things to resolve and where you are now as a writer. That's a very good question. And I want to say, I've been talking about the little mermaid, right? And then, and now like I've been talking about Sebastian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, I gotta tell you, first of all, why isn't Sebastian in this one? I was very upset. Send it to Disney. I'm so sorry. Go go ahead. No, no, it's fine. I mean, I think that's the whole thing. I think this is why I, this, this that is the process. The process of you are one thing. You think you are one thing. You have been told you are one thing. You you go outside and people see you a certain way. And then you start to realize and change that. Not even that you start to realize. You feel uncomfortable or you're, you, you're not sure that this is exactly you. And you have to make a choice of whether. And I think the two characters in that story kind of represent two different reactions of change. And obviously the change happens most to one person the physical change mm -hmm. but you know you you can have different reactions to how to that feeling you can just outright be like i'm ignoring the the weird feeling i don't like it i don't want things to change i 
well, I'm going to just try my best to continue the, on the same way and live that way. Um, or you can be like, no, I'm going to embrace this or I'm going to go and do this thing even though it's scary. And mm-hmm. I, I think that story, that story is a very personal story because it's also about me being queer. Like my queer feelings are in there. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it, it's really about expectations of what you expect of yourself and what other people expect of you and how you're supposed to behave and if you're behaving the right way. And even when you do behave the right way, the resentment you might feel. Yeah. Sort of. So, yeah, that is 100%. That story has all of those feelings of coming to terms and changing. And in, in my writing as well, being like starting off with a story about a white picket fence family well there's a divorce so it's not that great (laughs) but uh an american family who's this way and going completely in the opposite direction now where it's like i'm writing in dialect and i'm writing folklore from trinidad and is nothing like what i started off with but process was necessary and i gotta tell you no no this is exactly where where i wanted us to go because it is so moving and i feel like just from our conversation, of course, it, it feels like you wouldn't have been able to write this story when you started writing uh, again eight years ago. I mean, this is something no, with with confidence that is very specific about what it wants to say. And I just love that that metaphor, this idea of transformation and, and a kind of transcendence that um, that is true, right? That is that is a personal truth made universal for others to to take in as well so i i really love this i thought it was just such a, a beautiful piece and thank you so much this was lovely let's let's talk about for for a moment here i just got a couple more questions for you to be mindful of your time but you have a collection oh coming i got up. time you got time you're good okay <laughs> uh yeah. let, let's talk about your upcoming collection uh how do you arrive at this point of having a collection uh put together so this is interesting thing so you're you touched on this 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 theme of transformation and you you we've been talking about it we've been, we even um broached it when you mentioned uh w- about changing or getting or hiding um stories from the past that may be offensive now mm-hmm. you, you you we kind of broached it too so i have been writing uh submitting and writing since 2000 Submitting. I did write a little bit before, but submitting since 2015. And about 2019, just before the pandemic, started noticing that all these stories were about shapeshifters. I kept every story that came out of my keyboard was about a shapeshifter. Mm. And it's obviously because, as you very uh, perceptively pointed out I've been wrestling with this in my mind this 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 idea of change and process and accepting who you are and even if you're an outsider um you know accepting who you are and then when you accept who you are how does that affect the people around you how does that affect your family how do they react this has been going on and part of it was unconscious but I started noticing it very it was loud. I was like, why do I keep writing all these shapeshifter stories? I have so much material. I can put together a collection. Shapeshifter stories. And you can even see the progress in the stories of they're very Canadian or they're very Western. And then you start to see the stories themselves over those few years start to change and become more non-Western, become more brown become the language changing into something else. So I was like, okay, the stories are all shapeshifter stories, but the arc of my writing is shapeshifting. I've changed. Mm -hmm. And so I said to myself, you know, I have enough here to put together a collection. Um, I had about 30K that I wanted to include. I haven't included everything. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a novelette that sort of fit that theme to be the central piece. Mm-hmm. And I wrote Dwen, which is the end story of the collection, which is completely Trinidadian, has nothing to do with Canada there are, at all. It's a completely different story. I put that all together, and then I thought, well, I see all these other people getting collections. 
and I don't see why I can't have one too. <laughs> so I started emailing. I emailed a couple publishers that I had had short stories with before, and said, "Would you be interested in in doing a collection?" And the author said, "Yeah, we'd look at it." And eventually, Dave was the one who said, "Yeah, I'll publish it." So that's how I ended up with Neon Hemlock. But Neon Hemlock and I have a good vibe. Uh, they've published a couple of my other stories. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it wasn't a complete cold call to work with Dave. And I, I adore Dave. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what was the process in terms of, of getting the manuscript ready for publication? Was the manuscript in in need of, of some work or, or when some things are already published, uh, do you feel pretty confident about what they already are? Yeah. So I did not alter or change anything that was previously published. Mm, okay. um, so I had, I, I just, a friend was asking me about how to put together a collection the other day. So what I usually Usually for collections, you'll see people say anything like, usually, so this is not a strict rule. You'll see people say things like 40K and at the high end, 70K. That's, that's how much you need. So I had gone through my work and I had, I had more than 30K published, but I felt that the 30K that I chose fit together. Mm. So those were already published. I did not touch them. I just put them in the collection. Mm. I sat down and wrote the novelette. That is about 10K. That has not been edited uh, by a professional editor. I had beta readers read mm. it. And then I wrote a short story, and that is 6K. That I also put in there. So 16,000 words. Um, have were not edited or published at the time that I submitted the collection. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, uh, do you feel like there's going to be a lot of work in in those remaining uh, word counts? No, you're pretty you're pretty good on it. I think so. The last story, the six K one, while I was waiting for everyone to make a decision, they, <laughs> the, I was getting impatient, so I took the last story and submitted it to the dark and got it published nice so now that one's off the table i'm not changing it i mean <laughs> it's gonna sound horrible and i don't like, like boasting about myself but that story is the one that's currently nominated for the nebula award so i'm like you know i'm not really gonna <laughs> it's fine <laughs> you're okay <laughs> well congrats on that that's Thank wonderful you. to hear that was a little flex there. I don't usually do that. No, you got to You got to no, But that's no. the thing is sometimes you, you got to set down the humility and say, listen, I'm putting my foot down. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I was like, no, I'm not changing it. I do expect Dave to come back with edits for the novelette. Mm. Uh, I'm not, I am much better at writing shorter stories than longer stories, though I do have a novella coming out next year. So I am expecting edits. I don't expect that they will be large structural edits. Mm. I'm expecting things like, could you expand this? Or I don't think this word fits. Or um, maybe we can take out this line. Or this, this. Sometimes I don't think this will happen too much with this. But sometimes you'll get, mm, I, this metaphor, I think you can push it more. Yeah. Something like that. I'm expecting things like, I'm not expecting rewrite this story mm. at all. That's a good place to be. So here we go. Two more questions, because uh, this has been amazing. Thank you. you. You've been at the writing game for, for a while now, and culturally there is a transformation that has taken place. And I'm curious how this has impacted your relationship with your family and your culture, how they see your writing, or perhaps uh, are there some gaps that still need to be cared for? I'm going to answer the question, but I'm going to answer it with a caveat. I tend to keep my private life and my writing life completely separate. Mm. Uh, I don't, I, like I'm going to talk about it here, but I don't talk about my, I talk about my mother on the internet because it's funny, <laughs> but I don't ever like, in, like sort of mix the two. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very separate. But I think a lot of immigrants 
families have a similar idea with their parents wanting them to be a doctor or a lawyer or go to university and <laughs> become something that is like professional, quote unquote. I ended up becoming an, an ESL teacher. Mm. So I, I did that for many years. I, I think if I had gone to my parents, and said, I want to study creative writing in university. I don't think that would work. <laughs> yeah. I think they would have said, you can't eat words. Uh, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? You're going to waste money. They, they, they would have said, you're going to waste money and, and with creative writing, and you're not going to be able to eat. Mm. So, I, I, you know, I did the practical route of being a teacher. So my family mother and family do not read my work generally some of it they have read um they're very proud of me though mm. my mom is ecstatic about everything i do but she's not a reader so mm. yeah there is a gap there i have as i said my life is totally separate there's it so they don't they don't like if i had a book really she would come mm -hmm. but she wouldn't have read the book <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. But it's that understanding. And I think it's a very, it's a very adult thing. It's a very mature thing to do, which is understand that you don't need that kind of fulfillment from your family, even though they love you more than anything in the whole world. And that oh, the, yeah. it took a very long time. Yeah, for me to accept that. But it's it's a very adult thing to realize as a creative person, the people you love most may not be there a hundred percent in that regard, but you, that doesn't mean that you should question their deep love and support for you. Uh, and, and that's, uh, did, did that happen to you? Like, oh, did absolutely. you, did you go through that? I, I think, you know, I have a lot of, <laughs> I, I have some issues, but I feel like, um, Sure, we it, all do. It took me a very <laughs> long time to, to figure that out. Be, but what I was doing, and I have done this for a very long time, I have conflated my creative output with my sort of my my worth <laughs> in many respects. Right. And, and I think for the last maybe eight to 10 years, that, that has been probably the biggest change in my life is that I've acknowledged that the people closest to you love you more than anything, but they will not be there in this other creative way, you know? Uh, and I, I think that that's something that I've, that I've tried to work on as best I can is acknowledge that and, and realize that that's not a bad thing. Uh, there's, there's nothing inherently this wrong with that. This goes back to what you were saying about when you were a kid, you felt like an outsider. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, that, it's that thing, and I, I had that too, right? Mm -hmm. He was sitting there reading books, you know, and my mom had never read those books. And she, but she wanted me to read them. She was like, "Okay, <laughs> you read. Get good at reading." Yeah. Um, but she cannot, she cannot interact with me with the book like another reader would because she hasn't read it and she is not going to read it. She yeah. might watch a movie of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I said this to someone the other day. It's that you know. As long as someone isn't hurting you or like doing something abusive to you, you have to meet people where they are. Yes. And, um, you know, it would it would be nice if you know, but it'd be nice if she read my work. But at the same time, there's also like adult themes and concepts, and I'm like, I don't want my mom reading that. Yeah, yeah. I I had that same reaction when I um I premiered my my first play at the university of wyoming and Ooh, what's that called it, it's called videotape for lupe at the end of the world and it's it's okay. it's something that only a 20 year old would write like 20 i was like 23 24 but it has very mm -hmm. like heavy themes of of how horrible we are as as men and we I, i'm trying to reconcile that in a way but i have a an immigrant protagonist and all kinds of weird stuff but it's it's offensive i mean it's a it's a very um, explicit show in, in some respects. And I'm like, for a moment, for just a split second, can you imagine, I can't imagine my mom sitting in the audience and watching this. Like it is, just, it's too much, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, Catholic background and all this stuff. Like, no, I was really exercising. Yeah, all of that. You would talk to this like, mom, get up. You have to leave during this part of the show. Mom, okay, like, 
just stick around for the monologue and then bail for the rest because it's horrific. <laughs> this is not going to yeah. go over well. But uh, you don't need this. You don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one more question, then I'll I'll let you enjoy your Sunday. But um, sure. What would you say to to a young person of color who's getting into writing, somebody who feels that otherness inside of them and is looking to venture into into storytelling? Uh, what kinds of things would you say to somebody at the beginning of their journey? I always find this question interesting. Um, I'm going to separate it into two into two different threads. So if I was meeting a kid, let's say I was meeting someone who was, okay, we're not going to say kids. We're going to say, Let's say someone in their in their twenties or thirties, and they they want to write. Um, what I would first say to anybody who wants to write, when you become a short story writer, there's so much on the internet about how to become a short story writer and how how to sell. And when you sell, these are the magazines you need to sell to, and these are the bucket list magazines that everybody submits to. And what I what I first would say is I want I would tell them to write what they love or write what they feel or write you know people always say write what you know write what you know doesn't necessarily mean everyday reality I don't know what it's like to be a mermaid <laughs> I've never <laughs> been a mermaid never I've never been one of these other things but I know what it's like to feel alone or I know what it's like to feel resentful or jealous or frustrated. And so I, I would say to them, write what you know, write what you feel, write what you think is important. And then while you're doing that, go and read, 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 read things that you love, read things that you hate, get a friend. And, and talk about why you love this line in this book or this story and why you thought it worked and why. And when you really focus on that and, you know, these things, when you put time into that aspect of it, you'll find that you start writing these stories that people say, at least I think people will say, wow, you know, I really felt the emotion in that or I really, I really connected with that because even though I'm not in that specific situation, I could feel the feeling that the person felt. Mm -hmm. So that's my personal suggestion is to do what you love. And I love and that enjoy so it. much. Yeah, I absolutely yeah. could agree more. And I think that's a beautiful note to end on. But Susan, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share oh, all of these insights. This, this vulnerability of culture that, that we need to approach and get closer to has been super inspiring to me. But I also want to thank you for how bold you are in your writing and your ability to take these cultural ideas and to, and to make genre, to elevate genre by, by going back to the thing that works in the genre, which is to talk about really difficult things in, in a beautiful way and uh, in a very emotional way. So I, I've been really inspired and I can't wait to read Skin Thief when it comes out in the fall. I hope that we get to chat down the road because this has been an absolute pleasure. Oh, for me too. Thank you so much for having me. This was like talking to a friend. I mean, I've never met you before, <laughs> but hey, we are friends now. Thank you, friend. I <laughs> really yeah, appreciate I'm glad. it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. All right. I will leave you to it, but I will be in touch on the internet, okay? Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Hang up. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.